Hey guys, my name is Atif Shanawaz. I'm an internal medicine doctor, and this channel is all about explaining medical topics in layman's terms. This video is the second part of my discussion on DVTs and PEs. In the first video, which is linked up over here, I go over the reasons why clots occur and what their symptoms are. I'm going to assume that you understand the concepts covered in that first video and are familiar with the terminology that I've outlined there. So if you haven't seen this first part yet, please check it out now. And if you haven't already, please click on that subscribe button if you'd like to see more content from this channel and the bell icon as well to keep you notified when new videos are uploaded. Now, in order to set this discussion up properly, let's get one important question answered first, which is why should we care about DVTs and PEs at all? Why are they a problem to begin with? Well, with a pulmonary embolism, the most dire problem we're concerned with is cardiac arrest, which obviously is as serious a problem as they come. The heart is forced to start pumping blood into a set of lungs that suddenly has some variable amount of blood vessels plugged up by clots. Sometimes it's just a small artery in the corner of the lung, but other times large major branches that lead into the lungs are plugged up. The heart now has to work harder to keep that blood pumping into the lungs, and if the clot burden is high, or if the heart is weak to begin with, the heart might not be up to the task, and as a result, the circulation system sort of comes to a halt and catastrophic cardiac arrest occurs. So it is this consequence of pulmonary emboli that make us clinicians consider very carefully if a patient may have it or not. We have what we call a high index of suspicion for this problem. Now with DVTs of the lower extremity, the most obvious complication of course is that that DVT could turn into a PE, but even if that never happened, another dreaded complication is something we call post-thrombotic syndrome. This is a problem that is caused by the effective incapacitation of deep veins in the legs where the clots have formed. The clots may eventually dissolve away, but they can still leave a lot of damage in their wake. The veins might not work as well as they used to, leading to blood backing up in the legs, a problem that's made worse by gravity. And when blood gets stuck in the legs, the remaining veins will get engorged and sometimes they even rupture because they're carrying too much load. These ruptured veins can sometimes turn into painful ulcers that don't heal well at all because, well, they've got a poor blood supply. Now the data on how many patients with DVTs go on to develop post-thrombotic syndrome is a little bit fuzzy, but it's been reported to be somewhere around 40 to 80% of patients. So it is far from being an uncommon complication. So now that we have framed the problem properly, let's go ahead and dig into the details. Let's get the diagnosis of DVT out of the way first because that one is actually a relatively straightforward problem. It's PEs that's the more complicated diagnosis to work through. As I've explained in the first video, most patients with DVTs will present with pain, swelling, and redness of the leg. And it's usually just one leg where the DVT occurs, although it can be both. So anytime a patient presents with these symptoms, an ultrasound of the legs is done. Now this is a relatively inexpensive and non-invasive test that clearly shows us what is going on in the deep veins i.e. is blood flowing there properly or is there a clot plugging things up? Like I said, this is a pretty straightforward problem. Now, a PE is a different issue altogether and there are two elements to the problem of why diagnosing a PE is a lot more complicated. The first issue is that symptoms of a PE can be very vague. Like I said in the first video, shortness of breath and chest pain that is pleuritic are two classic symptoms. But a lot of things can cause these two symptoms. And furthermore, many patients don't even have these two classic symptoms, even though they're called classic. They may just present with something as vague as wheezing or coughing, or sometimes they'll present after having what we call a syncope, which is just passing out, and that'll be the only sign they have. Other times it's something as subtle as an elevated heart rate, now, besides these vague symptoms, the second issue is that the test that we use to diagnose a PE is something called a contrasted CT scan of the chest. In this test, the patient has intravenous iodine-based dye injected into their body. So right away, this is a far more invasive test than a simple ultrasound in which an ultrasound probe is simply positioned over the body and no substances are injected inside the body. Now in the CT scan of the chest, when the dye is injected, the CAT scan takes a whole bunch of x-rays in rapid sequence to see how the dye is moving through the blood vessels in the lungs. If there are parts of the lungs where we don't see the dye progress because of a clot, it will show up on the test. It will show up on the imaging. Now the test for PE not only exposes the patient to radiation, 
but the dye itself can be a little toxic to the kidneys. In fact, if the patient already has some degree of kidney disease, putting this dye into them might result in severe end-stage kidney failure, the kind that requires permanent dialysis. So patients who have some kidney problems usually have this test avoided altogether. Now, furthermore, a significant number of patients also develop an allergic reaction, sometimes reaching the level of anaphylactic shock. So a contrasted CT is not some easy benign test like the leg ultrasound is. So combine these two problems potentially vague and ambiguous symptoms of a PE with potential serious side effects of the test that we use to run the diagnosis. What it boils down to is that we clinicians need to make sure that if we are running this test on the patient, then that risk is entirely justified. So what is the solution to this dilemma? Well, it's mathematics, actually, and it's specifically probability theory. Now, let me explain. Imagine a scenario, and bear with me here, but imagine a scenario where we decided to do a CAT scan on any patient who presents with something that could be interpreted as a possible PE. Anything that could be interpreted as a PE. So like I said, symptoms of coughing and wheezing will fall into this category. And as you might imagine, the number of tests that we would end up doing on people would be astronomical, and there would be a large number of patients who would develop side effects from the test. Now, there is no doubt that a certain number of PEs would be captured in this way, but without question, they would be far outnumbered by the number of side effects of the test. Now, using this approach, we physicians would ultimately be doing more harm than good. And in other words, our risk to benefit ratio would be way too high. So when dealing with such a population set, the risk of doing the workup outweighs the benefit. And I'm not even talking about the healthcare costs associated with such an approach. So in order to balance the risk to benefit ratio, the goal is to try to determine what the probability is that the patient might have a PE to begin with even before a test is being considered. And this is something that we call the pre-test probability. And it is an extremely important concept in medicine because it applies to all tests for all diseases. If the pre-test probability of a PE is extremely low, then the risk to benefit ratio will not be favorable in such a patient. And the best course of action is to not go hunting for a PE because the odds are that we will end up doing more harm than good by doing so. So now this leads us to the next question. How do we go about determining this thing that we call the pretest probability? Now for PEs, this problem has been studied pretty extensively and currently the best solution that we have is to apply a questionnaire with a scoring system. And the most commonly used one that we have is something called the Wells criteria. Now the questions that we ask in the Wells criteria should make some sense to you because we ask about things like whether or not the patient already has a DVT because DVTs can become PEs. So having one will raise the risk of having the other. It also asks about other things like is the heart rate elevated? Was there a period of immobilization? Was there a prior history of a DVT or a PE or cancer? Which as you will recall, could indicate the presence of a hypercoagulable state. So we go down the criteria and we add up these numbers and we come up with a score that is called the Wells score. A simplified result of the Wells criteria will divide patients into two categories, PE likely and PE unlikely categories. A high Wells score will earn the patient a PE likely category. And in those patients, the next step is to just go ahead and do that CAT scan and go looking for the PE. In effect, what we've done is we've made the call that in that particular patient who scored a PE likely, the risk to benefit ratio justifies the use of the CAT scan. Now, on the other hand, if a patient is graded as a PE unlikely, then in those patients, the next step is to do a simple blood test that is called the D-dimer. So the D-dimer is the name that is given to molecular fragments of clot. When a clot forms somewhere in the body, tiny fragments can sort of dust off the clot and be detected in the bloodstream. So if the D-dimer is done and it is negative, meaning that it isn't present in the blood, then at that point, we stop the pursuit of a PE diagnosis. And we do this because we know that patients with a low well score, along with a negative D-dimer, fall into a low pretest probability category and the risk to benefit ratio does not justify the pursuit of a PE. Now, the third scenario is that the patient has a PE unlikely score and then they do a D-dimer 
and that D dimer is positive. Now in that scenario, the next step is to go ahead and do a CAT scan. So you might ask, why not just do a D dimer on everybody? Why isn't that the test we use instead of a CAT scan? And the reason is that while the D dimer is a very sensitive test, meaning that if there is a blood clot, it will likely be positive, it is not a very specific test. So another way of saying that is that it could be positive in a bunch of other completely unrelated situations, such as the presence of any kind of inflammation or any kind of trauma. It can even be positive in pregnancy and it even becomes positive in old age. So doing a D-dimer on anyone who walks in with possible PE symptoms would also result in a lot of false positives and would lead to a lot of unnecessary uses of the CAT scan. So the math for the risk benefit ratio just doesn't work out. Now, I want to make a very important caveat here. When we use the Welsh criteria, it has to be done by a physician whose clinical judgment is that a diagnosis of a PE is very much a reasonable consideration. And this is totally a judgment call. There is no hard science that points the way there. Sometimes this judgment call is super easy and sometimes it's not so easy. And also, if the patient's symptoms can be explained by some other diagnosis, then the PE workup should end right there. For example, pleuritic chest pain and shortness of breath can also be caused by a pneumonia. So if that diagnosis is made first, then we need not entertain the idea of a PE any further just because pneumonia and PE share some common symptoms. The use of the Wells criteria, in other words, and the D-dimer are tools that the clinician uses to try to make the process of determining the pretest probability of a PE a little bit more objective, but only once they, in their clinical judgment, feel like a PE is a valid concern to have in the first place. It is not meant to be used for everyone and anyone who has chest pain or shortness of breath or wheezing or coughing. Now in the next video, I'm going to wrap up this introductory series into DVTs and PEs by going over the treatment options. Now, if you found value in this video, please go ahead and click on that like button as it really helps the channel grow. Feel free to put down comments and questions you have down in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video.